passage is really cool because it talks about God's plan when we don't see God's plan, I think. It talks about how we have these plans set in our heart. We have these plans that we think we're going to go do one thing, but sometimes God kind of sets us on a different course. He guides us um, along a path. He guides our steps. And it's really interesting because sometimes you're able to know, I, th I think God's calling me to do this, but I think sometimes there's times where you're just, I think I should do this. And I think that kind of comes down to what this passage is. And that's kind of what it says in the first verse to me. It says, to man belongs the plan of the heart, but from the Lord comes the reply of the tongue. So even though we have, you know, something set in place, he doesn't really change it, but he guides us. And it's really cool because sometimes you don't even see this stuff that he's doing, these God sightings. You don't notice what he's doing in your life. And I'm going to tell you a story about this one time where I had this really cool experience and I didn't even think of it as something that God had done until this summer. It was kind of just something that I thought, well, you know, that's just how it happened. And it was kind of a coincidence and none of it really was anything where I felt like God was telling me I needed to go do this, but it just kind of happened. And I think that's sometimes God sets these things up where they just kind of happen, but there are also those times where you realize that God is calling you to a certain thing where he's talking to you and you're listening and you're able to experience uh, his will for you. So the story is back when I was 15, I just got my permit and my dad wanted to go on a trip and he wanted to go camping up in like Colorado or Wyoming or something and that would have been tons of fun and you know I really like that stuff camping and done a lot of that but for some reason I I don't know I was I was not feeling it I was like I just don't really want to go camping out right now I don't know there wasn't really anything where God was like, don't go camping. You need to go this place. It was just, I don't, I don't know. And he, my dad told me, said that I can go, we can pick anywhere and we'll go wherever I pick. And so since I didn't want to go camping, I didn't really have any place I wanted to go. I didn't know where I wanted to go. And so I was just like, well, yeah, let's go to Florida, I guess. You know, it's warm, it's nice see the ocean, I would go surfing, uh, do some deep sea fishing, and uh, go see Hollywood Studios and see the Harry Potter place. You know, I really like Harry Potter. That was the main reason I wanted to go, and go on roller coasters. But there was something really cool about this trip. It was that we didn't plan to go there. You know, we had planned to go somewhere else. And we didn't really have a place where we were going down there. Uh, I didn't know where in Florida I wanted to go. I just said, let's go Florida. You know, it'd be cool to see the Harry Potter place. But we ended up staying out uh, on Cocoa Beach. That's where we stayed. We camped there at a campsite and visited the Ron John Surf Shop, got some gear, and, you know, went surfing for a couple days. But what happened was one of the nights... I was so tired. I slept so good that night. I I don't know why. I just slept so good out the whole night. Didn't hear a single thing. But my dad, he was up the whole night. He did not sleep because we had a rowdy neighbor. Uh, we had someone who had just gone out of jail and they were drinking and they kind of fight with their girlfriend and they ended up like throwing a riot over there and breaking stuff, throwing things. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty much a disaster the next morning, their campsite. Uh, so when I woke up, my dad was over there talking to him and he was cleaning everything up and I was sleeping. But when I got out there finally, 
I kind of caught on to what was going on, and I got to hear some of the story. And this guy who had just gone out of jail, he actually had a really good faith. He, you know, he struggled, but he had a really good foundation in the Bible. He really understood a lot of the stuff really well, and uh, he knew a lot about some of the theology that was going on. But he had been struggling with everything that's been going on. And we ended up talking to, I think my dad talked to him for like two or three hours. I woke up and was there for like 45 minutes. But it was this chance where we had to talk to this guy, be there for this guy, and talk about our faith, talk about, you know, what God means to us, and be there to help him as he's struggling. And what was really cool was he, at the time we were going out, I don't remember where we went that day, but he asked if uh, he could borrow a Bible if we had one so that he could, you know, read and try and get back on track. And oddly enough, my dad didn't bring his Bible to Florida with him. So I somehow, for some reason, brought my Bible. I, I don't know why. I didn't use it. I don't know why I brought it, but I brought this Bible, this one that I have right here, the one I really like. It was new at the time. It's got tons of study notes in it. I've learned so much from it, and it is amazing. And I, for some reason, am really attached to it, especially at that point. But I was really nervous to give away my Bible to him. But it was also this opportunity that we got to, for some reason, share God with this guy. And it wasn't planned at all. It was, for some reason, I said, let's go to Florida. For some reason, we picked a random campsite. And for some reason, it was one of those campsites where you got to pick your own site. And we walked around, we looked for a good one. We were like, that's the one we want to stay at. And somehow, this guy ends up at the campsite right next to us. And Somehow, for some reason, I brought my Bible. It's just stuff like that where I didn't really feel called by God. He didn't say anything to me personally, I don't think. But it was this whole experience that we were able to share that with that man, be there for him. And it didn't even occur to me until I started writing this sermon that, you know, God had a plan for that. That God was setting something in motion, that he was guiding our steps through that. It's things like that where we sometimes just pass them off as coincidence as I did until just now. And that's the cool thing about this passage is it hints at all the things that God does that we don't necessarily give him credit for. All the things where we have a plan and he's guiding us. So it almost seems like he's not influencing us because our plans are in line with him. It almost seems like, you know, I chose this, but, you know, God is helping us get where we're supposed to go. And a verse that goes along with this passage is Jeremiah ten twenty three, and it says, I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It is not for man to direct his steps. That goes along with this passage and how it just, it points out that our life is not our own. You know, we're living for God. He's the one true God, and that's who we're living for. And he's the one directing our steps. Now, we might have a plan. We might have uh, something in mind, but he's the one directing us. He's the one guiding us and helping us get there. And that really comes into play when you get to verse 3. The first three verses say, To man belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the reply of the tongue. All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. It's, it's when we commit our plans to the Lord, whatever they are, that they will succeed. It's when we're in connection with God, when we're praying, when we're worshiping, when we are studying the Bible and we are talking to God. That's when we're able to have this connection to God, that we're able to understand 
and see what his plan is. And not only will we understand what his plan is, but we're going to see how he's guiding us along the way, even when it's hard for us to see that that is maybe something that God's doing for us. When I think about times in the Bible where you know, God guides someone's steps, I think the biggest one is probably Jonah. And my dad did a sermon about jo- sermon series about Jonah uh, a couple months ago. And I think when we think about Jonah, he had a plan not to go to Nineveh. He did not want to be a part of any of that at all. But God had a greater plan for him. He, he wanted him to go and impact those people around him. He wanted him to make a difference in the community. It was how God, for some reason, decided to put Jonah in the belly of a whale, carry him over to Nineveh, and say, this is your purpose, Jonah. The other thing I think of when I think about times where Jesus has, you know, been there for us, where he's helped us through whatever we're going through, I think of the God carries us in the sand story, you know, where you see the two sets of footprints in the sand and then all of a sudden you just see the one and you're like, God, why why do I only see the one set? And he says, because that's where I carried you. That's where we were struggling. That's where we were hurt and we were kind of beaten down by whatever we were going through. That's where God was carrying us. He was guiding us. And that, you can see that in the fourth verse where it says, the Lord works out everything for his own ends, even the wicked for a day of disaster. Now, what this sounds like it's saying is it almost sounds like it's saying the Lord works out everything for his own ends, even the bad things. Therefore, he makes the bad things to use them to help us. It's not saying that he creates the bad things. It's saying that he uses them. It's saying that he's so powerful that not even the bad things can stop him, stop his purpose. Nothing so bad can happen that it can stop us. He's going to keep us safe and he's going to use that bad stuff so that we end up serving out his purpose. And James 1.13 and through 15 says that when tempted no one should say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone but each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed therefore after desire has conceived it, is, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death what it's saying here is God's not the one tempting us. He's not the one creating this wickedness, wickedness within us, but it's saying that we have desire. And when we let that desire grow, it grows into temptation. And when we give into that temptation, it becomes sin. And that's on us. That's how we uh, choose to live our lives. And no one's perfect, and that's normal. But what God did do was he sent his son to die on the cross. And he didn't just send any son. He sent a perfect son. He sent someone who came to this same earth that we live on, experienced the same desires, but he didn't give in. He didn't let them grow. He didn't let them become sin. And that's important because if God were to send his son and he gave in to sin, then he wouldn't be the perfect sacrifice to die on the cross for us. He lived a perfect life to die as a sacrifice on the cross for our sins so that we're saved by our faith. When Jesus experienced that temptation, he was able to say no when the devil was tempting him, when he was out fasting. But when we give in to those bad things, when we give into temptation and desire, God can still use those. That's what this verse is saying. It's saying 
that he is so powerful that he can work through the good and the bad and that he's going to get you to the plan that he has. He's going to get you to the end point no matter how hard things get, no matter how off track we get, he's going to set your motion right. He's going to put you on the right path towards God no matter how bad things get. And if you remember back in my first sermon quite a while ago now, um, there was a passage that I used from Romans. It was Romans 5, 1 through 12. And I'm going to reread verses 3 through 5 Because it says, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. That's a reminder that even when bad things happen, when we lose someone that's close to us, uh, when someone close to us gets affected by one of these natural disasters or cancer or someone that we love, we lose them. It shows that we might be suffering, but it says that that suffering is going to produce perseverance and that perseverance, character, and that character, hope in God. It's going to produce something that we didn't have before. It's going to be something where God can say, I know this is bad, but I still love you, and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to set your path right. I have a plan for you still, and this is not going to stop you. That's what this bad stuff can be. It can be something where he can work through anything. He is this God who is greater than we'll ever imagine and nothing will ever stop him. The last couple verses say, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. In his heart, a man plants his course, but the Lord determines his steps. God's grace is going to save us and he will save us even when we let those desires turn into sin. But what this this little chunk here is saying is that when our ways are pleasing to the Lord, even our enemies are at peace with us. When we're able to be someone who lives out a good, a faithful Christian life and we're able to show the people around us what Christian love should look like, then even the people around us will have problems being our enemy. Because when we're Christians, we're called to live out Christian life and show Christian love to the people around us. This undeniable love for everyone, even if they'd just gotten out of jail and they'd thrown a riot at your campsite. Something where you're able to say, I forgive you, even if they maybe didn't do something wrong. Something we're able to show love to these people who need it. Uh, Just even the conversation we're able to have with them is sometimes so meaningful. Something that gets overlooked. But what we have to remember is we, we need to be better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. So even a little good is better than a lot of bad. Even if you have a lot of good, but you're still really bad, it's better to have just a little good than no bad. That's what being, living this Christian life looks like, this Christian love for these other people. That's what this passage is about. It's about saying, God, I'm here, and seeing how he's working in your life. Being willing to say, not my will, but your will, God. Being willy, willing to commit to his plan so that you may succeed. Verse 9 says, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. How often do we see that? 
how often do we see these times where I, I've just even said, oh, maybe I should go do this. And it's something I had to do, but, you know, it was something where I did at a different time than I probably would have done it. And I ran into this person, and I was able to have this experience where I was able to help them. I was able to be there for them, show that Christian love to them. And it's things like that where we think, oh, I just had to go run that errand. But no, it was God saying, do it now because this person needs you and I want you to be there for them. And he has that plan for all of us. And it's sometimes hard to think, oh, God, just God had a plan for me to go to Florida. Oh, that's the worst vacation. But it's these things where he has a say, even when we don't think he's saying anything. And that's what this passage is. Him saying something when we don't think he's saying something. Because he's always saying something. It's hard to listen sometimes and block out the noise around us and block out what we want to do. But he is saying stuff to us and he has a plan for us. And that's what I want to ask you guys to do when you leave. I want you to demonstrate that love, that Christian love, for other people. Something just where you're able to be kind to the people around you and they're able to just be changed by seeing that you're Christian. Not necessarily that you're bringing it up, but that you're just acting like you are and they're able to feel it and they're able to say, that's what I needed today. That we're able to be there for the people in our community, the people around us. That we're able to be willing to commit to whatever God's plan is that we're able to listen to what he has for us and work that he does work in our own lives, but also that as he works in our lives, he's changing the lives of the people around us and the community around us. And God is so powerful. He's so cool that he is able to say, I don't care how bad things get, but I'm still going to help you. I'm still going to use that as an experience for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it to make your faith stronger. I know that happened, and I'm sorry it happened, but I love you, and I'm going to take care of you. He works in the hard times. He works in the good times. He is a God who loves us no matter what, and we need to be able to commit our plans to him and what I ask of you as you go out this week is are you willing to follow God's will and not yours? Are you noticing the things where God's speaking but it doesn't feel like he's speaking? Are you noticing those times where you just think it's a coincidence where you just think I had to do that anyways? Are you Noticing how God is working in your lives, how our plans are in motion, but he's just helping us get there. He's helping us get to our final destination. He's guiding our steps. And it's hard to see that most of the time, but he is always working in our lives.